Welcome everyone to our um, RACE seminar today. It's about Git-based data management with the open source data lab tool. Uh, with me here in this seminar um, is Professor Michael Hanke and uh, Dr. Kaustu Patel, who are both essentially experts in data lab from different directions. So Michael is clearly someone who knows data lab in and out and Kaustu is someone who is really using it on a consumer basis um, every day. And the idea of the seminar is um, as follows. The agenda will be that I will just give you a small introduction of why we in RACE care about data management. With this, we go a little bit into the use cases of RACE um, just briefly because we put an emphasis more on the AI part. And AI is something, of course, which is very relevant for the RACE project, as you will see, but also putting the lights on traditional HPC simulations because they are also creating lots of data, generate data and use data. Then after my, let's say, warm up of race, why it is important for race, um, then we basically go um, in the details of data labs. So Michael will present in 40 minutes the details. So you can imagine it's not possible to go to tell you in the details, but at least gives you a very good introduction into the data lab, data management approach that may be become relevant for race. Uh, for different reasons, for simulation data, maybe also for AI data in terms of training, testing data. And it's really an interesting approach as you will realize when, when Michael is talking, because it's really this, this version control, which is kind of uh, with Git Annex and Git uh, in, included in this approach. After this, we have a short comfort break, uh, 10 minutes roughly, and then Kausto will basically give us insights from the neuroscience domain of how you use data lab in practice. And the neuroscience domain is very interesting um, because also they have large um, data sets on the one hand side, but also these AI models on the other hand, right? So in this sense, uh, I think it's a very interesting community where we in race, although we don't are in the neuroscience domain there, uh, can still learn how to deal with large data that you don't just put, let's say somewhere in, in some data management tool without thinking about it because here we're talking about really large quantities of data, maybe here and then the terabytes, and maybe in the future also when we go towards exascale, maybe even towards petabytes. We have quite some time reserved for the Q&A session. And as I said earlier also, please, if you see us talking, um, if you have already questions, put them in the chat, they're not forgotten. And we will basically put them uh, again back on the agenda when we have then the Q&A session at the end of the seminar. I should also inform you uh, once again, this seminar is recorded, right, for GDPR. Please be informed and you will find this on our YouTube channel. So who are the speakers? I already said Michael is quite an expert in data lab. He is the leader of the working group Psychoinformatics at the Institute of Neuroscience and Medicine 7 in Jülich. Um, you have here also the webpage for more information. And I think Michael and Kausto will both in, introduce themselves Kaustov is also from the same institute, um, also basically working here in the area of machine learning, which is quite interesting, in my opinion, really for the RACE project as well. So we see there a really good researcher and experienced AI researcher um, that, you know, basically has this machine learning aspect of it and can really tell us a little bit how you use data lab then as a consumer in daily practice. And basically myself, um, just shortly, I'm here at the University of Iceland teaching high performance computing and parallel and scalable machine learning. But I'm also having a research group at the Jülich Supercomputing Center of Forschungszentrum Jülich. And I should also mention in this context that uh, I'm also the EuroHPC uh, Joint Undertaking Governing Board member of Iceland. Hence this, org this event is really organized from the National Competence Center here at the EHPC um, in the actually in Iceland in collaboration with the RACE project, but also with the highball I will talk about. So here in Iceland, we have a, a setup of the community, which is called Simulation and Data Labs that we establish here in collaboration with the Uli Supercomputing Center based on a very long history and practice. Um, we have quite a big footprint here in remote sensing. That's also one of my areas of research where we basically in some rankings number six in the world. So this is quite a big aspect for us here in Iceland. And I should also say uh, our collaboration partners here are very strategic corporations. We have been part of the D projects 
um, which actually establishes in Europe the modular supercomputing approach. But then also we collaborate um, essentially with Jülich since very many years have joined PhD students, joined master students, and will go with Jülich hopefully towards the exascale performance in race and with the systems we have in Jülich with an exascale machine in 2023, 2024. And uh, another collaboration here I should mention um, from the University of Iceland perspective is a Lumi system. Also, this is a modular supercomputer. If you look on it, uh, Lumi is based in Finland, but basically paid by a consortium of very different uh, membership countries of the EU. If you want to know more about the modular supercomputing strategy, there's quite a nice YouTube video if you want in the Jülich channel available. Finally, I just want to point out that this seminar is also um, performed in highball, basically the collaboration between Canada, Germany and Iceland in terms of neuroscience. You see here the activities of our simulation data lab neuroscience, but highball is quite bigger, much more larger um, and tackles a lot of challenges of the human brain um, and has many different um, AI aspects also in it. You see here one of my PhD students, Peter Helgi Einerson, who is here basically our expert in Iceland in this area and is actually working on the cerebellum, the small brain, if you want. Um, that is, of course, part of the human brain and a part of the highball project. So with this, I think I would like to officially start the seminar. Uh, again, if you have questions, if you have, let's say, um, and some collaboration ideas, please feel free to use the chat. We have discussions later on where we can talk more in detail about this. I just want to proceed to the first agenda item um, where I will give you a little bit an idea of why we need data management uh, basically inside the project. Um, and I start with this with the use cases that we have. Um, if you want to know about the um, COE race project at large, of course, I just give you a very small introduction here now to put the emphasis really on data lab. But if you want to have more information, we have a nice website. You see it here at uh, www.coe-race.eu. The motivation and the approach from race can be summarized on this slide. So essentially, you know, that we have lots of, uh, let's say, uh, numerical simulations, simulations of physical phenomena um, based on known physical laws and basically numerical methods that solve iteratively some, let's say, uh, tough physical problem. That's one example of, let's say, very compute intensive aspects where we see exascale is really required. So we can always refine the simulations. We can always make it more accurate and all of these simulations, of course, have in common that they generate a lot of data. We call it maybe big data these days or large quantities of data. And the idea of race is to combine now these, let's say, more traditional HPC approaches with new technologies. And this is for once, of course, the AI that we have seen is very prominent in the last 10 years, especially because of deep learning and new approaches coming and then on the other hand, we have seen by using really cutting edge deep learning in combination with simulations, we really need much more orders of quantities of computing power. And this brings us quickly to exascale as you have seen in one of the introduction slides where we hopefully reach this in Europe in 2023, 2024. So it's not far away. So we have to think about how all the different applications can actually make use of this in research, um, how we can use the old codes now in combination with AI models and then really scale them up for exascale. And this could be with different, very different ways. We're talking often about surrogate models, but probably could be also hyperparameter optimization methods uh, where we also can learn something with particle filters, maybe about the parameter space of simulations. So there are many different ways how AI models can actually be used in context. In race, we would have kind of two kind of use cases. Um, again, more on the web pages. We have compute driven use cases in different areas here, um, which all share, of course, the, the part that they have somehow some generation of data. And uh, all of them then actually looking now in during the course of the project, how we can also make use from AI at exascale. The same goes for data driven use cases here. Is the physics not so let's say the, the key driver, although you see fundamental physics, of course, CERN, for instance, 
being one of the use cases here. But um, the key idea here is that we have lots of data already as a as a kind of um, starter. So we would have, um, let's say, 3D printer measurements of how you actually manufacture elements and then have lots of faults in the 3D printing. And we analyze that. So this brings you lots of data. Um, sound engineering is about how people would basically hear in virtual environments like the reality if you now see virtual reality is very getting very much better in, in images and in basically in the visualization that all looks good it sounds actually uh, not really very realistic and this gives you an idea of uh, really thinking about that we have to do something to improve the sounds in virtual environments and this is essentially what this use case is doing Now, looking on all the um, different uh, use cases we have, because of the time, I cannot go in all the details on it. Just again on the data side, we would have numerical simulations, uh, CFD simulations. They generate a lot of data, studying turbulence and these aspects is incredibly compute intensive. You need large systems and all of these systems generate outputs of the simulations that we will look in uh, wind farm layout. Um, if you have one wind wheel, it's very good understood from the physics perspective and from energy generation, if you have a power wind farm, you have again, basically turbulence of one variable that affects others. So we basically see a kind of complexity in this and all of this to solve this is really a research question. And in order to tackle this, we have basically yeah, this wind farm use cases on board and also they generate well, a lot of data. Maris, uh, your, your audio is breaking up. Sorry. Um, ah, okay, thank you. Yeah, now, it's, now it's good again. <laughs> Okay, yeah, not sure the connection should be good, but who knows. Um, but thank you very much. Um, before I talk with in the void, <laughs> nobody can hear me. That was good to hear. Thank you. Um, you see also the other ones. Um, again, I cannot go into all the details, but they all share here in one way or another that they generate a lot of data. And uh, of course, this now brings us to the question, what we do with all the data? Do we have a central repository at each of the different partner organizations? And then we have to transfer a lot of data again and again, if you want to do AI modeling, uh, what about the sustainability of the project? It's a COE, a center of excellence, that hopefully will run a long time, uh, not only the couple of years in the first funding period. So how we ensure that the data is basically there um, later on. Of course, this is more the generation perspective. I come to the AI perspective more towards the end of the call. Let us now look a little bit what the partners are. See the rates. You see, we have quite a combination of Europe from one end to the other. Cyprus is here, one end. Uh, while you see also here on the other end is Iceland, and we have a couple of partners also from industry, which is quite interesting. With Safran uh, developing new forms of helicopters. Um, this is quite interesting together with Surfax. So you see quite an interesting set of people on board. And the objectives of RACE um, are in actually quite ambitious. Here we're thinking about um, really using this kind of compute-driven use cases and the data-driven use cases for co-design. And co-design this time not really in terms of hardware, of creating a new supercomputer like many other projects are doing it uh, more on the other side here we're thinking about how we can co-design a kind of unique ai framework that really get all the requirements from these use cases on board still being you know based on open source community tools hpc best practices or is the AI audio is, is very bad again okay okay now i think let's think about um I was stopping at the use cases, so and the idea was really to create this AI library. However, that will be framed is, of course, a good question. So we have a co-design approach in the project. But before we talk a little bit about this, um, the question is also what you mean with an kind of AI and HPC cross method. And here's an example um, that you maybe see where you basically combine both of these worlds. Um, one example I did in the past. You think about weather predictions, that's something what everybody can understand. Maybe very quickly, you have, let's say, maybe all from thousand runs. You want to predict the future, what is a meteorological situation uh, over a specific region. And, and there, basically, you have a typical simulation based on you know known physical laws. 
But what you don't know is the parameter set perfectly, which of those ensembles are the best ones to predict. And what we then did as the kind of intertwined AI approach was, for instance, then using a particle filter approach to narrow down the parameter space in this coupled application so that we could already see, yeah, and there's like some of the ensembles already not useful. So you can stop them while they're already computing because they will not generate very good results. And so you see you can save computational time with it, which is one of good motivations for it. Also, if you think about then um, how you combine the AI models, for maybe an Excel scale really saving large footprints of computational time. And this is the same in, in the ideas for surrogate models like wind farms. You maybe don't have to simulate all the nine wind, field, wind fields in a wind farm. You maybe think about a deep learning network that can take care of some, and here and there learn deep learning network can take care of maybe some of the wind wheels. And then you also reduce the computational footprint to make it feasible again to study this better. But these are all different examples and all the use cases have their way how they do it. Now let's come back to the data generation. And I want to show you a little bit what that means uh, from some examples where we do some work in, in my research field, just as an example, because there we have concrete, let's say data. Here you see we break down a remote sensing problem, which is a satellite imaging um, basically data set. And then you have to classify the land cover in let's say 48 classes. And this is a typical machine learning approach. You would have then um, this data set available. You share with a research group and you use a supercomputer like you see here with students. Uh, it's the older generations of uh, GPUs we had already now. The generation of A100s we use, but with V100s, we use 96 GPUs in parallel. So you really fill these systems with lots of data and the deep learning networks that we use there for classifying. Um, also, of course, needs to be fueled with the data. And the interesting thing is you want to analyze then the results of the data, right? You want to understand, is it a good accuracy? Is it a really good, um, let's say, achievement that you do with your deep learning model? And nobody knows what are really the right parameter of such a model. And I come to this in a moment. Now, when you think now what that means is we, we have to prepare a hardware infrastructure that's pretty clear. And I think this is given with our supercomputer systems to us in, in uh, basically Finland, Iceland, but also the deep modular prototypes. We have Barcelona supercomputing on board, but also some unique hardware in terms of more quantum computers that you maybe use like accelerators today in the future for optimization problems in machine learning. Now, interesting is what we do with the software infrastructure. So there is lots of uh, elements unclear when we move to exascale, how large will be the scalability of deep learning frameworks, um, how we can actually interconnect. Um, then let's go ahead with this. The idea of the software infrastructure also, of course, includes now um, not only the deep learning networks we talked about, um, also different AI aspects of it, deep speed, horror to really scale up. Um, but the key question remains what we do on the data side. So do we have data repositories in the project? Um, how we work with the different, let's say, AI models that will come out again and again. And basically this brings more and more data sets, especially if you think about um, what we do in terms of AI, there's not always a very clear path that you say, you do this deep learning model, you train on it, you have some model done and you basically are finished with your job. So we see here on this slide that we have many different angles of how we would use AI in this different use cases. This could be not only scaling up, as I said earlier, with Horowat or deep speed to many different GPUs and uh, then generate different data sets on different scales of GPUs. It could be also that you have new, um, let's say, models to try out and you don't know if they work. We had already some discussions among the use cases where time series data is relevant, but nobody tells you that long short term memory models now would be the modus operandi, or you basically use maybe gated recurrent units only. So you will experiment with many of these AI models and you have many of them in parallel then uh, as part of the project. And all of them would probably have, let's say, uh, the requirement of searching for the right uh, setup of the parameter, something we call hyperparameter optimization. Then when we think about um, the data itself, we maybe don't use just one data set as is. We would have data augmentation approaches. We increase the set of uh, volume in the data. 
we are essentially thinking about um, different ways how to enrich the data so that we carve different features out. And then we want to benchmark HPC machines uh, with this new, let's say, algorithms. That means also there we have a run maybe on a couple of uh, GPUs, then more GPUs or on CPUs intertwined with a simulation now with AI. And we do this for different scales of CPUs and GPUs together. So you see in benchmarking alone, this will be lots of data again. And then we want to go in the project also to something we call neural architecture search. So finding the parameters of simulations intertwined with the deep learning then in a more semi-automatic way. And this also requires lots of computing, but also will generate lots of different data sets. So you see more and more where I'm getting to lots of data and how we carve out these requirements is in a two-fold process. We do this firstly with fact sheets in the process. And then uh, after that, we go to something we call an interaction room. And I just cannot talk many much about this. I just give you a short glimpse what a fact sheet looks like. We also publish with them usually to really get clarity a little bit at the beginning, where are all the different components. And you see here quite well that in some of our neuroscience projects, uh, we already use data lab, right? So there are some lessons learned where uh, Michael and Faustuf then will later in this seminar will talk about. And it's really used in practice. Now, when we think about the fact sheets, they're really early versions we have in the projects. As you know, CU Race perhaps is just starting in a way. So we got all these fact sheets now. We got a rough understanding of the work uh, basically that we have in the project. And all of them have really uh, some emphasis on parallel file systems, on really data generation, on the idea of using lots of data for AI and also in the simulation space. And when we then will now come to all these different AI models that you see here a little bit illustrated from all these different use cases that we have, it's also that we don't have just one AI model that we use. We have different models in parallel. You see here, perhaps autoencoders and actually um, something we call uh, physics informed deep learning will be used or neural architecture search in combination with transfer learning. So also the AI models is another dimension really of creating lots of different data sets. What we then do is basically, and we are in the process right now with all of the different use cases to perform so-called interaction rooms. Um, these are basically um, a very nice methodology to really carve the requirements once again out, much more detailed than fact sheets. Um, if you want to know more about this, please go to our YouTube channel of the CEO RACE project and also maybe consider subscribing to it. So that's an important aspect of it for us as a European Commission project. And please go there if you want to learn more. All the seminar that we had in April about the interaction room is there recorded. Uh, just to give you a glimpse of the interaction room that we do with so-called mural boards, um, you see there we have different canvases where we then with the use case experts and AI experts and HPC experts carve out the requirements for data, but also for the AI models. Hence, we have a problem canvas, which often is related to the physics or to the data science uh, problem that we're going to solve. The data canvas shows really the ideas about the data itself. So something like validation sets, training sets, testing sets for AI are relevant. Then the models, what AI models could be interesting, uh, time series models like short, long, short term memory, or do we use image-based uh, aspects with a ResNet 50, with convolutional neural networks, and so forth. The architecture design canvas here on the bottom also alludes a little bit to our HPC setups. As you know, we want to scale up, and this brings also the constraints. So we need certain libraries on these HPC machines to scale. And also here in the architecture canvas is something where, of course, data lab then now plays a role, how we can organize data lab to be, let's say, one, one good idea of sharing this between all the different HPC centers, between all the different research groups, and, and how we can achieve this. Because here we think about a very distributed setup in the European project, where AI experts are not on one side, they are across different organizations. Now, finally, uh, let's come a little bit to the idea of machine learning, just to understand that data is, of course, a very centric approach for machine learning. Um, if you want, machine learning also means learning from data. And for us, in the exascale domain, we see a race and all this large simulation runs, we talk about learning from big data. 
And this is something where um, you can see it's, it's a field which is basically joined with data mining methods, applied statistics and machine learning. But all of them have this kind of three considerations um, that you basically have always as a key ingredient for an AI problem in a way. You would always say some pattern exists somewhere and you hope to, to explore this. You have not an exact formula, that's why you use AI. And this is a bit different from the simulation sciences because there are physical formulas that you would go ahead and implement. Right and do a numerical weather prediction as an example. You implement and then go forward with the simulation over time and iterate. But that's something in AI you don't really have. So what you do is to learn from the data something what you would might call function approximation, but it's a little bit more elaborate than this. But learning from data is really the key aspect of it. And of course, we have lots of challenges with it. It's often really a complex data sets, um, high dimensional data sets, a low amount of data quantities in different classes. And we require really these days, these HPC machines to learning from data efficiently. When you see the overall process of machine learning and for people that want to learn more, of course, we have machine learning courses here at the University of Iceland. Uh, also on YouTube is something uh, on my channel. Just briefly, let me elaborate the process, which is really then generating again and again data. All people know is usually that we basically consume data. We use training samples that have been basically given to us by some target function we don't know, right? Somewhere in the nature, which might be the ideal function. We still assume though, it's basically coming out of the same probability distribution. So if you have, let's say Netflix movies, you'd not necessarily recommend the ones that you really see in the cinema. Um, this is a different probability distribution where the data comes from. But in the end, you would say the training examples are our core business in machine learning. We're using them. And some of them have, let's say, labels, which makes it then a, let's say, more easier problem so that we can really learn from a vector of data sets here and that have some label. An example is, for instance, if you have this hyperspectral data sets in remote sensing here, um, you really have um, then maybe 200 dimensions of data with basically different spectrums of light and the wave basically that's coming out from the satellite catch back and you give a label already and you basically have given a label that could be water or um, something else in terms of land cover. So this, this label data gives us then the opportunity to use machine learning examples. And this is just a supervised learning setup. Of course, an unsupervised learning setup looks a little bit different, but the same idea applies. Now you do the learning algorithm um, and they're always a learning algorithm and a hypothesis set. You would say the hypothesis set is something like a support vector machine, but it needs to be trained. It needs to be looked at. And this is what you do with a learning algorithm like quadratic programming, or you have neural networks and you have back propagation, which is a learning algorithm behind it. So they're different. They always come together, but you never know which one to pick, right? This is never, nobody really tells you. So you have a large idea of hypothesis set and all of them generating data, using them, trying them out and thinking about accuracy and saying, okay, I measure the accuracy um, in base of error measures. And then I can maybe go to the final hypothesis and say, that's the best model. But to go towards this is a very long way. You don't go and just throw a machine learning problem on it. And I think the other talks also will talk much more about it in detail just to come and carve out now again for the data generation, what it means for CU arrays is it's, it's pretty clear that we have sensors. Uh, many of you know CERN, for instance, right? It generates with a large Hadron Collider, uh, many different data sets, which I have to be preserved and that we also want to analyze in the project. Here you see again, the example of remote sensing with satellites. Um, they generate with more higher resolutions daily, tons of data we want to analyze. So that's on the data generation side. And the same was valid for the uh, basically physics-based simulation we have there in the beginning. But now the key challenge for CU arrays why also versioning control and all of this might be interesting in data lab is now then the idea of all these parameters that you see exactly here. This is actually a, a hyperparameter set of just one network and this is loaded. You never know if that's really the best setup. You maybe want to change several aspects. Of it. You have here an optimizer called SGD. Maybe you want another optimizer like Adam. You have different layers of neurons here in this convolutional neural network examples. And you can play with different depth 
of the layers, uh, ResNet 50, or you go with the ResNet 152, more layers, more data to train, uh, and so forth. Largely, the data that is then coming out is what you see between those layers. So all the weights that have been trained, the signals that have been going through were strengthening the weights with different learning algorithms, as I was alluding to here in this example, would be backpropagation, uh, basically adopted to the deep learning domain. But still, the point is really, as an AI expert, you play around with these. And as I said, with neural architecture search and auto machine learning, you try to do this in a semi-automated fashion, but still you cannot really automate the process fully. You still have to go back, you have to check the accuracy, see what can you change in the architecture of the network, in the learning algorithm, um, with different optimizers, maybe different loss functions that are relevant, how long you train is a very, very, let's say, considerable aspect. Also for statistic learning theory, you can learn too long to overfit, for example. What are the batch sizes? This is really critical because we have HPC machines. We have to get the batches on different nodes. So they, and then basically using maybe uh, something like Horowitz to exchange it again. So long story short, it's a long process machine learning and will generate a lot of data and arrays um, that we already have lots of experience with. But how to handle this is now the question in the EU project. And that's why we need really something like data lab. In the light of the time and the technical difficulties we had, um, and I hope it's not like this for Michael, I just would like to continue. I see there are already questions in the chat, but please feel free to continue. We will come back to the questions then uh, essentially after we have um, a short break and after Kausto was talking. So with this, thank you very much. And Michael, please feel free to start sharing. Thank you. Uh, I will try and I hope it works well. What about this? And I hope you can also hear me well. Yeah, we hear awesome. you and it looks good. Great. So um, thanks for the introduction and the, uh, the orientation uh, what COE Race is, is doing, especially uh, for me, that was helpful. Uh, and I will try to, to connect to some of the aspects um, that you mentioned in, in my talk. So um, daylight can be many things. Um, I, was, I was asked to present uh, daylight specifically, uh, you know, in the in the light or from the from the point of view of uh, it being a Git based um, research data management tool, so this is what I will do. My talk will be uh, split in uh, essentially three parts. In the beginning, I will I will explain on a on a very high level what what the tool is is trying to accomplish. Uh, in the in the middle part, I will go a little bit into the details of um, how it's actually working inside. And, and what its uh, principles are. And I will conclude the talk with, with, a, um, with a sketch of a, a concrete example of a high uh, throughput computing analysis uh, that we conducted with it, and then leave you with pointers where you can find out more about everything that I will not be talking about. Um, just quickly starting off with uh, acknowledgements. So this uh, uh, data led, the tool itself is a collaborative um, uh, development project, um, uh, in particular uh, in co collaboration with the group of uh, Yaroslav Alchenko at Dartmouth College um, and um, has accumulated more than 30 uh, contributors um, inside and outside uh, funded projects. There is a dedicated documentation project that, that comes with it because it's a complex tool that is that is necessary for it being uh, practically usable. Uh, that is led by uh, Dina Wagner and and in itself has almost um, thirty uh, contributors. And the use case that I'll present today uh, is done together with uh, Margot Jata Wilsba, um, Felix Hofstetter, and and Alex Wade. So. Um, to start, what is data led? And on a, on a very high level, um, the, the first thing that data led is trying to accomplish is the exhaustive tracking of research components. If you want to look at it from the scientific angle, you can also look at it uh, from the angle of you know, data and files, then it just wants to track everything that uh, is digital and, and is used in 
the research process at any at any stage. And it does that um, aiming to deliver well-structured uh, data sets, preferably using some community standards, which standards these are, uh, is of course, depending on the, on the community and also uh, portable computational environments. And then being able to track the evolution of each of those components inside uh, those data sets. And um, depending on which field you are in, uh, you, uh, you, you will either have heard about the reproducibility crisis or you are part of the reproducibility crisis. And, and this exhaustive tracking of the state of everything digital, digital that is uh, involved in a research process is an absolute uh, precondition for, for reproducibility because we first need to know what it is that we were processing inputs and outputs uh, identity. So this, the second thing that Daylight um, uh, aims to achieve is the capture of computational problems. So essentially everything that is the output of a computation, we need to capture enough information that in retrospect, we can go back and ask the question, where did this file come from, right? And ideally we, we, we capture enough provenance information in a good enough format that we can actually rerun that kind of uh, computation in order to give us the file back in case uh, it is a deterministic process, the exact file, or uh, something very close to it if, uh, if, if it's not a deterministic uh, computation. So and for that one, of course, we, we're putting together this idea that we have full control or we track exhaustively everything that's involved in computation, and in addition, put uh, computational provenance capture on top of that. What this will give us is essentially a self-contained data structure that knows everything about inputs and outputs and also the processes that generate the outputs that can be moved uh, between places, not just the data structure itself, but also uh, um, the, the, the actual hosting of the components that make up these data sets. So it, it kind of orthogonalizes the idea of what forms a data set from the decision making which pieces of a data set need to be hosted on which kind of computer infrastructure and, and the uh, maybe institutions co contributing those resources. Now, if we have all the pieces, if we have exhaustive tracking, provenance capture and uh, portability, we can actually uh, practically achieve reproducibility. So we can, we can move that uh, data structure to, to another place of, you know, uh, it's some sort of a validation environment, a collaborator or a consumer of the information that was published in a, in a, in a manuscript, in a journal somewhere, and aim for and hopefully achieve computational reproducibility. So just regenerating the results uh, that make up figure one in a, in a publication in order to provide uh, a, a most convenient or at least more convenient starting point for incremental uh, research and contributions than uh, there usually is today. And of course, how feasible that is depends on the complexity of the computations and so on, but uh, at least the building blocks um, data let uh, aims to, to provide. And then the last step, uh, when we are able to do uh, reproduction or we can reproduce results, then we actually have established a relatively trustworthy foundation to go for uh, reuse of individual uh, research outputs. So, and, and that, that, that establishment of a trustworthy foundation to build third party work on uh, is, is absolutely critical. And it is essentially the, 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 the end result of that process that started with tracking and capture and reproduction uh, as to, to form a trusted uh, reusable component and then can be put into bigger contexts, right? So you can think of it as uh, a, a validated and, and trained uh, AI model if you want, right? So that is, that is exhaustively versioned and, and has complete provenance that is then uh, put as a workhorse into some kind of application. So uh, given that very high level uh, introduction, you can think of it, uh, you can think of Datalet as a tool that uh, can manage the evolution of digital objects, whatever that they may be, right? As, as long as you can, uh, you can express some content in the form of a file, 
uh, it is compatible with data led and it can be put uh, together into data sets that uh, and their evolution can be managed uh, with data led. So um, maybe that's, uh, that's, that's sufficient for a, a, a general introduction. I want to uh, summarize some of the advantages. I, I briefly mentioned uh, most of them already, but just to you know, draw in, uh, an interim conclusion. So what data led provides is some kind of an overlay data structure. It's, it's essentially um, some collection of actionable metadata that, that combines individual digital items into a data set for a specific purpose. And it focuses on, the, on, the, on, on what it is that forms the data set and not necessarily on where that is. It can provide uh, redundant uh, tracking of, uh, of computational environments and storage resources. Uh, and importantly, they can change over time. So the, the notion of a data set of a specific kind of purpose uh, can evolve over time with changes in, in, uh, in, in technical systems that uh, it requires for its existence. And these self-contained units, they're, they're valid and, and complete without any external services. So they, they can contain actually all the data, but they don't have to. And uh, there's, there's critically no de dependency on any sort of uh, running uh, infrastructure like a, a database server that needs to exist at a particular address or something like this. So it's a complete uh, uh, decentralized system. Uh, importantly, it can, uh, it can process a plurality of, of, of metadata. And in, in this talk, I'll specifically focus on, on provenance metadata. I'll come to a concrete example uh, later on. Uh, the key fact is that DataLet implements uh, the, the philosophy of uh, it not being the best idea to make you know, long-lasting decisions on the optimal representation of metadata for the purpose of transport and query, but uh, to implement a system that can dynamically regenerate metadata according to whatever is today's most appropriate form to report metadata for a specific purpose. Uh, so it has a concept of metadata extractors that can be uh, programmatically rerun on the same pristine uh, data that may generate much different metadata in 20 years than they, they, they would do now and participate in the evolution of these uh, standards themselves. And altogether, uh, uh, we believe that it's a viable system for long-term duration and, and the, the, the execution of data stewardship for uh, data sets uh, that require it. So um, this idea of having a standard uh, overlay data structure that kind of serves as a compatibility layer between other technical system pretty much gives any data led user automatic compatibility with a bunch of uh, other systems. So you can, uh, you can uh, talk to AWS S3 as, as storage without, as a consumer, knowing that this is actually uh, uh, happening or implementing specific support for it. Uh, it supports all kinds of domain specific services like, like Open Neuro in the, the neurosciences as, as a data platform, but also other computational systems. And you could go uh, right now to datasets.datalite.org and, and get an example of a large collection of thousands of datasets that are hosted across a range of different uh, uh, data portals with different storage mechanisms and authentication schemes. And the, the data access to individual files in all these datasets would look exactly, uh, um, for exactly the same for, for a range of, of datasets. So it abstracts away the uh, peculiarities of the technical system systems uh, quite successfully. Um, and if you actually want to see how uh, you can uh, build an entire uh, academic paper with it, uh, I'm linking here, I will not show it uh, now for time reasons, uh, an actual paper that was, that was published in Behavioral Research Methods that is built from scratch from the actual underlying raw data where, where everything is essentially linked into a data -led data set and a simple make can uh, can reproduce the entire paper that you could you could try for yourself if you're in the mood. So um, that would be the the high level uh, uh, general introduction, and I would um, 
now continue with giving a rough idea of how it works internally. And it was already in the title that um, Datalet is, uh, is essentially a, a Git-based research data management. So uh, it will not come as a surprise that uh, it is built on Git and you've, you'll find Git inside uh, Datalet. And actually, um, even more precisely, any Datalet data set is, is a Git repository. So if you if you have a Git repository, you can you can work on it with Datalet, and Datalet will only uh, inject uh, very uh, little uh, information into that Git repository to make it a full uh, uh, Datalet dataset. But practically any Git repository is compatible with Datalet, and uh, Datalet datasets are fully compatible with just Git, and that's that's a key fact. Um, the the principles just condensed uh, that we have in, in Datalet is that there are only two things in the world uh, that Datalet recognizes, data, data sets and files, and data sets are collections of files. And it is as domain agnostic as Git in that sense. So Git self-describes as the stupid content tracker, and, uh, and, and Datalet aims to be you know, as stupid in, in that sense. So it makes no requirements of uh, what kind of information you're putting into a data set, as long as it can be a file. Um, importantly, we, we want to minimize custom procedures and data structures. So what I briefly already mentioned that, that any uh, data the data set is fully compatible with just Git is a key feature of the system. So uh, given that uh, Datalet is being developed in an academic context, um, we can have some expectation of its, uh, of its uh, longevity. And the way Datalet is constructed, it wants to ensure its users against failure of Datalet itself. So if you're using Datalet, and for whatever reason, it, its development is, is, is discontinued or needs to be replaced with something else, technically, you will have created lots of Git repositories. And, and we have the hope that given the prevalence of, of Git as a technology of, um, in, in the software development field, collaborative and globally, uh, there will be a transition to another technology that can also be applied to all the uh, data sets that Datalet uh, will, uh, will, have, will have produced over time. And uh, we also make no uh, compromises regarding the decentralization. So everything that Datalet does requires no central services. Uh, that does not say or imply that we cannot make use of central services. So if you have a uh, you know, storage system like, like Google Cloud Storage or AWS, uh, we definitely want to use that and we are capable of, of using that, but it will not be a requirement of any uh, core component of the Datalet system. So for those who've uh, used Git already, uh, you will probably know that Git itself doesn't handle you know, terabyte-sized files uh, very well due to the way uh, it works. So Datalet is, is not doing that. It's not putting large files into Git. What it does is it uses uh, another tool called Git Annex um, that essentially uses checksums to track file identity instead of the actual file content with Git. So instead of having a terabyte size blob in there, we have uh, a SHA sum or another uh, checksum uh, checked into Git plus the information where we can obtain that content from. And Git Annex is really flexible uh, in that regard. So you can, you can, pull, uh, you can pull content from uh, almost any storage system uh, known to man, including uh, BitTorrent and, and IPFS and, and all kinds of esoteric things. So in some sense, it is similar to uh, uh, Git uh, uh, LFS, which uh, some of you might know. The, the main difference is that Git Annex is as, uh, has, has the same decentralization philosophy that Git has and that Datalet has. Uh, and it requires, in contrast to LFS, uh, no central uh, service and is really flexible in terms of uh, granularity, uh, granularity of uh, you know, obtaining individual files from, from large data sets. Um, now, if it's, you know, if these two uh, technical components uh, deliver most of the features, then what is data lit for? Uh, you might ask, which would be a valid question. And the, there's a, there's a, there are various reasons. The single most important reason from my uh, point of view is that a single repository is frequently just not enough. Um, Git and Git Annex 
uh, are primarily designed to work in the single repository case. Git provides means to connect uh, repositories together, which we are using in Datalet, but primarily uh, you will find that most use of Git is focused on individual uh, repositories. But uh, that's not really a suitable model for science. Um, and there are various reasons. One is um, logistics and, 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 and technical reasons. For example, uh, in the neurosciences, at least, we have lots of data sets that have you know, millions of files. Uh, Git will struggle if you put 50 million files into a single repository, or if you're doing programmatic uh, provenance capture, you quickly end up with hundreds of thousands of commits. If you put them all in the same, uh, uh, in the same repository, Git will struggle. Um, you can also have you know, uh, file system uh, issues if you, if you have a checkout of a Git repository that forces you to have hundreds of thousands of files unconditionally, uh, the, the, um, uh, the HPC systems that uh, Moises have mentioned, they use uh, commercial file systems uh, with licensing based on number of inodes and so on. And so, so there's actually a cost factor behind that, how many files you would want to have. Uh, then there's also a target audience problem. So Git incrementally uh, enriches a history. And for some kind of data, for example, personal health data, you will want to pay extra attention to not putting any kind of information in there that is not applicable or not uh, authorized to be shared with a particular uh, target audience. So for some data sets, uh, it will be unavoidable that these will be personal data and they cannot be shared. If everything goes into a single repository, that means nothing can be shared. That is nothing, that's not a model that is appropriate for a uh, scientific publication. And then if, there's also uh, an, an uh, evolutionary uh, aspect of it. Uh, data evolves at different paces. Morris gave the, uh, the example of you know, AI models being repeatedly trained and, and you know, hyperparameter optimization uh, going on. But uh, there's also the issue uh, that the data that they're being trained on is static, right? So if you put all the, uh, this information into the same uh, data set all the time, then uh, you will have a large static component in a repository with a continuously changing component uh, uh, in the same repository. So you're impacting the, the respective other parts with the problems of, um, uh, of, of the others and that um, can be avoided and should be avoided. So you can think of data also uh, as some sort of a modular data management tool that, that you, where you can isolate the pieces the modules of data that that uh, belong together, and then you can you can plug them uh, um, into each other and and track their uh, dependencies. And that's a that's a much more appropriate workflow for science because in general we're aggregating across time and uh, and contributors, you know, combining prior works into something that that hasn't been done before. So. Uh, for those interested, I'm, I'm linking here a talk where you can see an actual uh, comparison of uh, a plain Git and Git Annex based workflow with how it would feel or actually look like if you do that with, with data led by the text along. So I'm, I'm just uh, uh, showing it here. You can find it on YouTube. So uh, to summarize this more technical uh, introduction to data led, it is a modular data dependency management tool. So you can you can specify um, you can you can you can modularize the projects from the data perspective and use and reuse the the, the components that were produced maybe by uh, unique sets of collaborators uh, in increasingly larger scale all the way up to uh, scientific uh, publications. And uh, it's a system that, that scales. So here I, uh, I'm, I have a screenshot of a, a, a GitHub project. That is actually a data, data set. You could, you could go uh, there uh, today. It tracks, uh, it's, the, it's the human connectome project uh, data set. It's one of the, one of the uh, most frequently reused resources in, in neuroimaging. And it comprises 15 million files and 80 terabytes. Uh, it's distributed across uh, uh, four and a half thousand data led data sets. But if you if you data led clone it from, from GitHub directly, and none of the files are actually on GitHub, it will feel like a single Git 
uh, uh, monorepository because DataLed makes these connections between uh, individual subdata sets uh, almost seamless. So the last bit uh, uh, of technical importance that I want to uh, talk about before I quickly give an example of a use case is that uh, DataLed adds metadata to Git that Git itself is not adding. And uh, most importantly, that is process information. So you can capture arbitrary uh, um, data transformations as that you can run in the command line uh, in, a, in a, a fairly simplistic way, which I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a second, that adds the critical information how this, did this file came to be uh, to Git without introducing uh, you know, any, any technical, additional technical system that does that. Uh, so the simple way uh, that we're doing it, we're using Git's commit message uh, in order to, to store that information. We can also, we, we're also capable of doing it in a different way, but, but in the simplest way, we're using Git commit messages. We're basically adding a structured record to a, a commit message that puts in enough information to recompute or re-execute uh, an operation that was done. And you will, you will see it fits in a screenshot of a single page, so it's really simplistic, but it actually scales, uh, scales, scales quite far. And we're not changing the, the, the concept of commit message, right? The commit message in a Git repository is meant to say why that change was done. We're using it how exactly that change was done to, to record that information. So you can, you can uh, make a, a slight change um, by introducing the concept of, of, of containerized environments. So uh, without changing the concept of putting information on how to store uh, process information in Git commit message, there's a, there's a data -led extension called containers that you can simply use to wrap any computation, uh, any command line into a containerized execution in a container that is also tracked inside a data -led data set because you know container image just a file as long as the file it's compatible so you will have the inputs tracked with data -led, the computational environment tracked with data -led, and the provenance information of the generated outputs from that containerized uh, uh, pipeline also tracked uh, with data -led. so and with these uh, simple pieces I can present you uh, one use case uh, that we that we uh, recently uh, assembled or processed um, that that hopefully gives you a sense of the scalability of the system. So there's a there's a data set uh, called the UK Biobank um, that is the the largest health data set uh, that exists at, on the, on the planet at the moment. Um, the imaging portion of it, so brain imaging, uh, uh, not brain imaging, but medical imaging portion, so uh, 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 MRI images and so on, is uh, at the moment uh, something like 80 terabytes and 43 million files, so it's a sizable data set, uh, and it contains 42,000, uh, the health data records of 42,000 uh, participants. It is under a strict uh, data usage agreement, so there, there are many things that you cannot do with this data set. And it requires a custom binary downloader to actually obtain, you know, the content of that data set. And, and most are shipped to you as unversioned zip files. So you, you basically get what the UK Biobank has as a zip download at the time where you ask it, right? And of course, that is, that is not very comprehensive in, in terms of creating such a, you know, definitive record of, of inputs uh, that yield reproducible uh, outputs eventually. So we had a bunch of challenges. Uh, we wanted to process this data in a way that the results are computational reproducible without the original computer infrastructure, because that's usually the reader of an academic manuscript does not have access to the computers uh, that you use to, to compute the results on. And we wanted uh, to do it in a way that there's a complete linkage from the results to the individual uh, uh, data record downloads. And uh, that we could scale it up to the amount of available compute resources that are available to us or to anyone uh, at the time. So we more or less arbitrarily uh, picked a, a complicated uh, data processing um, a pipeline that was implemented in MATLAB that has all kinds of issues. There was a, a, essentially a compiled MATLAB blob for us to uh, not you know, have to deal with licensing servers and so on. Uh, roughly, uh, there was a, a, a one hour processing time per image. There are 41,000 uh, images uh, to process. And um, 
all massively, uh, 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 not massively, but embarrassingly parallel. So no interdependencies between the jobs, uh, just one hour per image. They could all run in parallel if possible. Uh, 1.2 uh, million output files, 30 files per input image, roughly uh, 1.2 terabytes of, of total size of outputs. So total size of outputs, not really an issue, uh, but 1.2 million files uh, already might be on, on some systems or for, for some uh, resource allocations, I would say, not the systems themselves. So uh, first challenge, how, how can we version such a data set, right? That is, that is huge, it's not versioned uh, in, in, in an appropriate way uh, at the end of the provider. So we implemented a data extension, data let the system can be extended with special purpose uh, packages that captures the download process with the data let run command that I briefly introduced. That's the thing that enriches the commit message. So it basically runs the binary downloader, capturing the parameters and the times and who, who did it uh, on which machines. And it then indexes the content of all the zip files. So we, we, we not only track all the archives and their identity, uh, where we can then, you know, where we then have all the information to uh, re-download them, um, but we also know what they contain and their identity, and DataLite makes it possible to specifically request a file that was only ever available inside a zip file, and it will know which archive to obtain from where, and then unpack it and put that individual file uh, in, in the place where it needs to be. And it also does problematic restructuring of that data set to a uh, community standard that was formed basically after uh, the UK Biobank decided to adopt uh, their data set layout and is more compatible with the tools uh, that are used um, nowadays. So this, this, this package yields one data -led data set per participant. So we're talking about 41,000 uh, individual Git repositories, and they're all bound together by a single data -led super data set, which is just another Git repository that has 41,000 uh, sub data sets or in Git's terms, 41,000 sub modules. And data -led does it in a way that it's actually not uh, creeping slow. Um, so I already mentioned that each file can be, uh, each file of the 43 million files in that data set can be tracked to this specific download, including the information uh, who downloaded it, um, where and when. And uh, when we repeatedly update this data set, we can actually build up a version history that's not even available at the, uh, at the data provider's end. So we can, we can tell with confidence which files changed between releases of a data set for which participants. And we can use that information actually to trigger recomputations. So when we know data has been fixed for a particular set of subjects, uh, participants, we can actually stage them for recomputation automatically without somebody going through that uh, by hand, which is impossible at that size, pretty much. So the second uh, issue was staging that data on, on the HPC. So uh, all the advantages that I mentioned before, they also introduce uh, technical overhead, right? So if we're processing 41,000 uh, images, that's actually not much, right? We could just put them in a directory uh, on a GPFS uh, uh, system and that would be it. But the versioning overhead, the Git convenience that is added to it, adds a large number uh, of files to it, which brings us in the range of several million files um, suddenly uh, hosting the entire data set. So uh, to that comes the number of, uh, of, of, of output files that we want to uh, generate. And um, so we needed some sort of a, a system that, that, can, that allows us to host all that. And we developed a, a, a again, very simplistic, you know, plain file system data store that allows us to represent a data a data set with 20 inodes, regardless of the size of that data set. So it, the data set itself can contain millions of files uh, and, and, and store terabytes of data. It will be 20 inodes heavy on an HPC system. And I'll just give you a sense how that looks. Uh, this is basically how it looks on the file system. Uh, it's, a, it's a fully self-contained uh, 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 directory. It can be R-synced between machines. It's fairly convenient, a tool that you know, most people uh, use, it's, it's efficient, it's supported. And uh, I'll just give you a sense of how that thing is assembled. So it basically starts with a, a tree that is made of uh, checksums. In this case, this is uh, a broken up UUID. Every data -led data set has a unique identifier, UUID, globally unique. Um, and so when we put 
you know, data sets in there, they, they, they essentially get a unique place in that data store automatically. The second part is just a bare Git repository. So that is how it would look like on any uh, Git hosting uh, services, meaning also Git can be pointed to that location and you would have the, the, the functionality that you would expect. So there's nothing uh, custom in there. Then there is the Git Annex object tree. This is where the actual file content is hosted if uh, Git Annex places it in there. You can see it's again a nested tree uh, build up of checksums of the dataset uh, content. And we can replace or amend that with a compressed or just containerized version of that object tree in a 7-zip container. A 7-zip container gives, gives us a nice uh, random access reperformance that is basically flat, so the container is indexed. So we can put a million Git Annex objects or file content blobs into a single file, and that together gives us 20 inodes for a functional uh, data lit data set. And that we used to, to stage the, the data set with all 41,000 participants. So the entire uh, collection of data that we need, all 80 terabytes, put into just under uh, a million inodes, fully uh, accessible. And the last challenge we had is actually conduct a high throughput uh, compute, computation with these tools in order to yield the results that are completely tracked and, and reproducible. And uh, that is um, that has some complications, again, uh, uh, rooted in, in the way Git works. So Git is a collaborative tool uh, where, where you normally work on software, right? And then sometimes you have two, soft, uh, two software developers committing things uh, and pushing them back to a central repository. At the same time, in our case, it would be thousands of compute jobs, you know, finishing every second um, uh, in, in, in during peak uh, times in, in that computation. So there's lots of synchronization effort and you cannot simply put a lock on the entire repository because it will be a major bottleneck and you will not be able to scale with your uh, compute resources. So we developed a high throughput workflow with minimal, minimal uh, locking overhead and in full compatibility with that system that I explained up to now and that can be adopted to different batch handlers. So, um, I think I'm already quite late, so I'll not uh, go into the details of that workflow, but just quickly, there was a, there was a place, I hope you can see my mouse pointer, uh, there, was a, there was a place where the data set um, was assembled, then put into one of these data stores uh, that I mentioned, and then the scheduled compute jobs would individually take only the pieces of the data set that were relevant for that specific compute job out of that data store, assemble a checkout of the pieces that are needed. So in, in our case, just a single participant's uh, sub data set, then do the computation containerized on the compute nodes, then save the new state of the, uh, of the data set after that individual computation. So creating a commit with that provenance information and then pushing back that commit and placing the generated uh, file content objects uh, into a different output store. And that was done in order to uh, have no, no uh, um, uh, interdependencies between the, the, the pull and the push part of the, the, the Git operations. And then after the computations were finished, there was a, a large, uh, for, for those who are Git experts, uh, Git can do something that's called octopus merges. Uh, usually that's, uh, that's used to merge uh, 10 non-conflicting branches together at the same time. We used it to merge uh, 41,000 branches uh, together at the same time, which is uh, you know, funny for those who have, who have used Git. It's, it's uh, uh, probably the largest merge in, in Git history. Um, and the outcome of that was a single data set that captured all the results and each and every single result was, uh, uh, is completely um, recomputable. And it turns out that we were able to uh, generate bit identical results for, uh, for over 50% of the cases, which is, is quite unique for a neuroimaging uh, data pipeline because they're all not made to be deterministic uh, uh, computations. But in this case, um, we, we um, we achieved this quite remarkable result. So what you can see here is, is a, a, a visual history of that output data set. So people uh, 
assembled the analysis and that was scheduled on the HPC system. So every dot in here is a file that's being generated and you can see the timestamp at the top. So the entire analysis finished, uh, finished in, in, in 12 hours and every single bit is recorded in Git history. Now, the tool we used here for visualization is a tool called GORS, which uh, is used to visualize development history. But again, because a data data set is just a Git repository, we can just use it for data data sets to visualize uh, um, the, the outcomes of, of workflows with no additional effort. So uh, I want to complete, conclude here with a pointer to uh, the data handbook. It's a, it's a um, fairly comprehensive um, um, uh, document that gives you insights in what, what data can do uh, in particular. And I think that connects well to what uh, Maurice has said. Uh, it it uh, has use cases and demonstrations how you can use data led for particular contexts. So here is, for example, a demo how you can use data led for reproducible machine learning analysis that that captures well this aspect of you know repeated uh, analysis for hyperparameter optimization and so on. Uh, for those who use uh, different Git based tools that that do specifically that that are not as generic as as data led. Uh, there's, for example, DVC. Uh, there's a dedicated comparison between how a DVC workflow would look like if executed with data led. And uh, if you are uh, you know, interested in, in getting a sense of that in the coffee break, there's also a, a YouTube uh, recording of a tutorial that shows you data led specifically for machine learning uh, applications. It's all linked in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the handbook. Okay, so... Uh, and I'll thank you for your attention. And again, for the invitation, I'll leave the slide up with, with some links for those who are interested to learn more. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. I hope everybody can hear me now. Yes. Yes, excellent. OK, yeah, once again, Michael, excellent talk. Of course, in the light of time, we could not have all the details. But I think it's an interesting tool. Also, thanks to Adina already um, actually <laughs> answering some questions. Um, that's very good. Uh, so I thought there's really a, a community behind data lab that you can already experience here in the seminar. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for attending and thanks, Michelle, for the very nice uh, introduction to data lab. So my perspective here is as a data lab user, um, my background is in uh, engineering and more recently into application of machine learning to neuroscience problems and we will get into a little bit of details um, very soon. Okay. So the content of this talk is organized as a very naive user who has never used a data management system before and wants to make this transition so to adopt this new technology of research data management because of all the good things that we heard about um, using RDM uh, from Michelle's talk. I'm also very basic Git user, so I do not know much about Git. I can make a commit, I can pull a repository, I can push some changes, but that's more or less it. So that's at the stage uh, where I started uh, looking into data lab, trying to use it and talk about a conceptual and technical walkthrough of what happened when I started using data lab, the problems I encountered and how we managed to solve them. And then finally, I will also give a plan for where we want to go with this, how to combine uh, RDM and machine learning, especially using data lab. Uh, before I start in the, with the actual thing, here is a background of the, the cluster uh, that we use at INM7. Uh, it uses HD Condor in the background and it's more or less as you can imagine, a standard uh, cluster configuration. We uh, create submit files. We send them to the cluster, and the cluster executes the job. Uh, there is an NFS uh, where the data is stored. Of course, the NFS uh, access is uh, usually slower than the local access, and this will become part of the, how we design the system uh, to use data lab. Also, a very quick introduction to how the data is organized. It usually helps if there is some kind of common organization uh, of the data across different data sets. So there is a standard called BITS, uh, which is evolving, of course, but uh, it's quite mature and it's used uh, in the neuroscientific community uh, with many, many data sets. Um, the nice thing is like once we know how the data is uh, organized, we know what to expect and we can basically build 
apps and plug and play plug and play kind of software which we can uh, immediately integrate into different workflows there are also apps available already um, and whatever we build on top we try to at least make it base compatible um, so we can use it uh, in a reusable way and also share it with other people okay with that uh, michael uh, gave a very nice introduction to data lab so I will just talk about mostly about how to consume data. So very, very simplistic view on data lab without using all of its very nice functionality. We, we just think of a use case uh, where the data is somewhere. We know the data set uh, repository link and using that we just want to get the data and use it in our workflow. So that's the very, very simple case we are going to look at. And it already comes with some challenges for a naive user like me. Right? So the, the aim here is to just to show that, yes, there might be some challenges, but they are not very difficult. So to make some kind of first steps. It, the data lab offers a very nice command line interface and data lab clone, as you can imagine, is very similar to git clone where you get the repository and put it in a, in a disk. Right? And data lab get is used on a file or a data set where you can actually pull the content of the file. So with this basic information, that's all we needed for the first stage. Uh, and this is the conceptual idea. So when I started thinking about data lab, looked into the documentation a little bit, and then said, okay, let's start using it because of all its good things. And uh, I will also give some more detailed explanation of like why uh, it's a must to use in many, especially new big scale uh, neuroscience problems. So the, on the left, hand side, what you see is, is basically a consumer view. We use data lab just to stage the data, just to get the files. So we just use it as a, some kind of a system which knows where the files are, which we then copy them locally. We run our analysis. We have our code, which works already. And this is already um, a quite good step and good test case uh, that I started with. And slowly we are moving towards what we will, I would call a complete reproducer workflow where everything is tracked from the initial the data originates, uh, where it originates until the analysis run, the output and everything is tracked. So that's the goal. But I of course put it here at consumer. Uh, why uh, we want to use this because data lab gives a unified interface to data. So the data can live on our local cluster uh, on AWS services or UK Biobank data set that has been created, or there are even services uh, like Open Neuro that already give uh, data led uh, specific data led uh, compatible data sets we, we can directly use, so open source data sets. So it's a unified interface. We can just say data led, give me a particular data set from Open Neuro. We have that locally and we can immediately start using it. So it's, it's a very good thing to have this UI interface. We can easily plug and play data sets uh, as well. So this is the use case. This is the first workflow. We have already existing pipeline, which is the human connectome projects with uh, Michelle also mentioned. It's one of the most commonly used uh, neuroscience, neuroimaging uh, data sets. The, it's locally on the disk. So for the existing pipeline, we take uh, that data set from the disk calculate, for example, some connectomes on all the subjects, and then do some machine learning analysis, for example, to predict um, some score uh, that's also available in this data set. Now, what we want to do is to replace the local disk with the data set. Data. And to do this, what we need to do is basically get the repository and then use the data lab get command for the subject, whichever we want to connect the connectome for. We do it for each subject one by one. And then we have, let's say, our first uh, data led uh, workflow. But as you can imagine, immediately as we start using a new technology, things happen. Things that uh, sometimes make sense if you're an advanced user, but if you're not an advanced user or even uh, intermediate user, then things happen that might not make sense. And this is what happened. Uh, and I'm going to give you a few examples of what happened and what we did in that case. So the issue in that case was basically we started this uh, to design this pipeline with a student who ran the data lab clone command. And then I tried to do the data lab get into this data set and bam, it didn't work. Right. 
Um, so of course, then we need to needed to go into the documentation, check, uh, ask for help uh, from the very nice community, and basically, data lab is user centric. It's secure. Of course, we don't want someone to randomly make changes to our data set, right? So it's it's a good thing. But in this case, we wanted to share a data set uh, between collaborators, for example. Um, so there is um, a way to deal with this, and we basically tell data, data lab when you clone the data set directly and share it with the group, and then it gives right access to all the members of the group. And then we solve this issue. So if multiple people could run get command into the data set, then the first uh, issue was gone, and then we ran into the next one, right? And then the next one was basically uh, there are many concurrent read write one per subject. Let's say we have 1,000 subjects that are concurrent operations happening, and at the end, data set is a Git repo. Files get locked, unlocked. I, as a very basic Git user, um, I didn't know what to do, right? And again, with the help of the community and the very nice workflows that Michelle has developed and shared also online, uh, the solution was to create a two-way clone. And what that basically means, we clone it locally for each subject. So for each subject, we create a new clone, get the data of that particular subject, use it, and then forget about this. One. So we just need to save the output in some place where we can access it uh, afterwards. This worked very well. And then in the next, right? Uh, for example, we wanted to use MATLAB in this case, and there is no API uh, for MATLAB for using data lab. So of course we can use bash scripts and glue different components so we can basically in the best script do like a data lab get and then call the MATLAB command or whatever else. But here we thought like it might be to have everything in one place. So we try to use a system call within MATLAB. But in that case the problem was MATLAB has its own environment complete with system libraries with everything with executables everything that it needs it puts it in one place and uses it. Now there is a clash between the system and data lab and things did not work. And the solution was relatively straightforward. We had to, before calling um, the data lab through system call, we just had to tell it like, do not use the library path that MATLAB sets uh, beforehand. And this uh, reverted to the system paths and everything worked fine. Of course, if you are using a Python-based uh, project or developing a Python-based project, please use the Python API, it's excellent. It's, it's very, very good then we don't have all these problems of gluing different codes and, and things together. Okay, so with after solving all these problems, this is how the first workflow looked like as a data consumer. So as a user, we had, okay, in this case, we have a human connecting project. We had a pipeline that takes data of one subject, a nifty file in this case, and creates a result. We had to define some parameters for the cluster, and then we say, okay, uh, run, for a bunch of subjects, this code here, which basically contains of two parts. So one is the data lab part, and one is let's say processing part. The data lab is basically cloning the repository locally. So this is our local throwaway clone, as I mentioned. It gets the file, then it passes control over to the processing script, creates the output file. And because it's a, it's a temporary directory that we are storing everything, of course, we don't want to lose our output then we move that to the NFS. Then it's accessible to, to us afterwards. And as a data consumer, this worked very, very nicely. So here we could capture exactly data was taken from which location, but we did not capture in this case, how data was generated. So data lab also offers all these possibilities, but it, as a first use case, we did not use it because we are building gradually in that direction. Now, why to use uh, data lab in this case is there is very, very big data sets um, uh, available in the neuroimaging community. And one of them is UK Web Bank, which Michelle also mentioned. It has lot and lot of subjects, which is very good for answering machine learning related questions, uh, especially to create modeling. Uh, to, if, let's say we want to predict uh, brain age prediction or for example, some, some cognitive score, more the subject better. Problem is, it does not fit locally, this data set. So there is no way I can just take everything, put it even on the cluster storage on the NFS and start using it. 
Uh, it might be feasible in some cases, but, but very unlikely, I would say. Also, the data changes dynamically. For example, subjects can withdraw their consent, and then we have to remove this uh, from our analysis. So to do this is basically data lab solves both of these issues very, very, very nicely. Right? So we can basically take the data as we need, so on demand, and also who withdrew their consent is automatically tracked and our analysis is compliant uh, with the regulations. To coming to the machine learning part uh, of the story, so we have developed a very simple thin layer on scikit-learn, which is called ULearn, uh, following the convention. The idea is to provide a one-line cross-validation tool. Um, of course, you, you have to prepare the data and so on, but once the data is prepared, in one line, you can uh, do the cross-validation analysis. It has some additional benefits. Uh, it provides confound removal, which is a very big uh, issue in many uh, problems, especially in clinical domains. Uh, and as far as we know, there are no standardized tools to do uh, confound removal in machine learning. So we implemented this. Um, it does it cross validation consistent way because of time limitations. I will not go into details of how exactly it is done. So if you're interested, just get in touch or look at the documentation uh, online. Uh, it also supports Pandas data frames, which uh, surprisingly scikit-learn um, does not so far, as far as I know. And we, there are also many examples. Uh, so you can go through this uh, examples if you like. So here is how a machine learning pipeline, a, a simplistic machine learning pipeline, to be honest, would look like. So there are already different feature sets. There are different scores one might to predict. There are train and test splits that one has to do. So uh, Maurice also very nicely explained that the machine learning is not like you, we throw the data at it and everything happens, but there is many, many things that needs to be set um, before we can actually get a model. So this is one uh, ex example of how this can happen. And here you see already there's that more than 3000 pipelines. So if we run this in a traditional way, we are lose most of the information of exactly what happened when. So this is just an example, but you can imagine this is gets even more complicated uh, with different feature sets, uh, different algorithms, different way pre-process the data and so on. So we want to track all of this. Uh, and that's why uh, we are moving towards data led. So how did it look like? So this is ongoing work. So the first stage as a complete data consumer I would consider it's done, right? So we know how to consume data using data lab. We can count ourselves as like the basic users of data lab. And now we want to improve uh, with that. And we want to capture more and more information uh, with data lab. So the way we envision this is basically a user basically tells us like, this is the data set that we want to use. So here's the, the data lab data repository, a list of subjects and one pipeline, for example, that converts the subject files into some output files. So as before, we follow our what the lessons that we learned. So we create a throwaway clone, process the data, we move this to NFS, but this time we will also track this output with data lab. So once all the data is there for all the subjects, there can be call control um, over that. And then a user can trigger the machine learning or group analysis uh, on top of that. Now, as we know, this is not a simple case of just running it. So there are multiple things that need to happen. There are algorithm choices, hyperparameter choices, feature choices, and so on. So this will, is going to be in almost some kind of a iterative process. And all of this, we want to track and follow uh, capturing what happened, how the data was split, which algorithms were run, where the outputs are, what the performance was. So all of this information will be tracked uh, using data lab. One additional important thing is reusability of whatever we are doing. So let's say we have 50,000 subjects just running this, this feature extraction part. Let's say we go get from the raw data into some kind of features that we want to use for machine learning. What if some other user wants to do exactly the same thing or something very similar to this? It doesn't even need to be exactly the same, right? Should we do the whole computation again? And our feeling is like, no. So the user should have an option. So if someone has already done this and what do I mean by this exactly right so this is basically the whole analysis of going from the raw data until here so if we are tracking everything with data lab then we know exactly what was done we can provide this information to the user and that look a similar uh, computation has been done 
and for these 50,000 subjects, and this is what these were the exact steps that were followed. So this metadata that gets saved, we want to use it as uh, a reusability um, information for new users to run their analysis with similar type of feature extractions. So to summarize, this research data management for machine learning. So I just talked about brain imaging a little bit, but there's a lot of other stuff. Of course, well, as one can imagine, there is behavior uh, that's being tracked, symptoms, uh, different cognitive scores, clinical scores that are being tracked. Of course, there is genetic information that is available. So all of this uh, we want to combine with data lab and you learn, plus there are additional tools, of course, in the future. But for now, these two are, let's say, ready to use. Uh, so we are building on top of these. And as usual, the goal is to create novel insights uh, using machine learning uh, for, for neuroimaging data. So take home message uh, real quick. Technology adoption is hard. At least that's my experience as always. Um, but in this case, if we go step by step, uh, it's easy to make the transition, you slightly adapt the code to include, let's say as a consumer, uh, data lab and then slowly integrate more and more things. And the benefits definitely outweigh uh, the, the learning that needs to happen in this case. So that's uh, my experience with this so far. And with that, I would like to thank you, of course, for your attention um, and the, the acknowledgements for the supporting uh, projects as well as people at INM7. I listed only a few, but of course the whole INM7 was very, very helpful. This. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Carl Stupa. Very interesting talk. Should mention all the slides will be, of course, connected. We have a couple of questions, and I have to say many of them have been also partly addressed already, so um, that's good in the chat. Is there someone who has a burning question right now, perhaps? In once. Nobody in the audience want to ask a question? I have one burning question. So when I think about how people can get started with StataLab, um, thinking also we have a project with FZJ and uh, you're using this in the Institute of Neuroscience and Medicine, how realistic would it be to, let's say, reuse the same installation, the same setup that we have in Jülich already for another community, which is now neuroscience? Um, I'm not sure, Michael or Kaustup, um, what do you think about this? Is it easy? May, does it make sense? Do we need another data lab instance better? Um, what is your feeling? I can make a start. The uh, um, if you if you look into the data lab handbook, there's a there's a dedicated um, you know installation section as you would expect, and uh, the 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 data lab deployment on the the JSEs uh, uh, systems is pretty much two lines uh, in a in a Python virtual environment, and and that's it. So we didn't even approach uh, um, you know some sort of deployment consolidation because there's really no no cost. Um, I mean, internally for, for our own institute's cluster, uh, that runs uh, Debian and uh, Datalet is a normal Debian package. So you app get installed Datalet and that's it. Um, for uh, for Macintosh, uh, there's it's available in Brew. And uh, for Windows, it's the usual complicated thing, but it also works on Windows. Um, but I don't think anybody uses HPC on Windows. So it's more, more an anecdote. All right, thank you. Um, Kaustup, you want to add something from your experience as a community user? I, I definitely, I would just second what Michelle just said. So starting to use DataLab is extremely easy. So of course there can be always technical challenges uh, because of the, the expertise uh, of the person and exactly what one wants to do because it's a system that allows you want to do many, many things. But the basic use is very, very straightforward. And I will really recommend so to, to look at the handbook, the examples especially, and the, they just work, right? So that's all I can say. Um, it's a very nice experience to see things working. 
Okay, yeah, I think, especially I think many of us here in the project will be probably users as you. And of course, uh, would be good to have a system that really works. However, we see what Michael also was alluding to many of the systems which are very good cost a lot and or commercial systems. And I think here it would be a really good idea to use it. Maybe a follow on question before I get the audience back uh, into questioning. Do you aware of any community, let's say, that is adopting data lab that is not neuroscience? I mean, I know Seabrain Canada, I know Ulich, uh, many communities in one way or another are connected to neuroscience. But are there any other communities that, you know, you're aware of that you said? Um, we, we recently submitted uh, a, a paper on data led to the Journal of Open Source Software, and um, a part of the, the author list is, uh, is a person from uh, a climate research institute. And uh, uh, over the past weeks, we had uh, a chat with uh, you know, a NASA research center uh, that were looking into uh, adopting uh, some of it. So I, I, I don't know uh, to which degree it is being used and we, we don't, um, I mean, specifically there, and we don't do any sort of uh, user tracking. So we basically rely on people uh, showing up, asking for help and, and uh, or, or contributing features. So I think um, when you have a person that submits an actual pull request to the code repository, that is, that is for me a very interesting level of adoption. And, especially for a community driven uh, project uh, the this you know broad um, uh, I would say even co-ownership is is extremely important for uh, resilience long term okay yeah so maybe back to the audience any question that maybe was not answered in the chat Andreas you have a question go ahead Yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for the good presentation. It was uh, very interesting. Um, I was wondering, uh, so I understood that um, provenance tracking is also one of the key features of data lab, that you can track uh, the workflows over time and what happens with all the data and the data sets, et cetera. Um, I was wondering if you have worked on a, a workflow and uh, you get stuck at some point that some algorithm might not work as expected and you have generated already and tracked everything in data led uh, um, uh, uh, the whole process chain, let's say, uh, the, or the evolution of the data set. Um, and you need to go back to a certain point in time and start over again. Is it possible then to remove in data led uh, the, the process chain that which is wrong, you know, in quotes, uh, so that um, that it's not available for others, that others uh, would uh, make the same mistakes and follow the wrong pipeline instead of going the right direction, especially if you make it uh, public, let's say. Yeah, so um, I think there, there are various aspects. So one is, um, uh, I should mention that this run tool that I, that I, that I mentioned for capturing that process information, uh, there's also a rerun tool that can act on it. So what you can do is like if you if you uh, uh, if you decide you ba basically data lab does not decide for you what is the granularity with which you want to record results right this could be an extremely long running pipeline uh, that generates a single file and that's all behind one commit but you could also have the execution of every single Im embedded tool be one commit and you can tell that rerun tool to say okay here's the recording of my pipeline now rerun it but based on another state of the data set, right? And it will build up a parallel history, which then you can compare using standard Git tools, right? So you can, everything that you can do with Git, you can still do in that context because the commits themselves will either have the content or just the identity information of the, of the content that you, that you generate. So you can, you can specifically ask for, did this file change between, you know, between this and that, and you can provide uh, helpers basically that quantify changes and you can use git bisect to figure out which change in your code led to this type of magnitude of change so it's 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 a really powerful uh tool the uh the 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 last aspect of your question uh i think is basically concerned with rewriting history right so if you're if you're if you're generating a history and then at the end you want to get rid of uh everything that did not work or uh, was buggy for some reason and you don't want to you know share it for whatever reason technical not burden somebody with all the stuff that is irrelevant 
um, then you can also use standard Git. Uh, you can you can throw away. Uh, um, you can re-edit commits. You can specifically only share a single branch and leave everything else uh, privately. Uh, it's 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 whatever you can do with Git. Um, uh, and, and here we're getting into also the forensics, basically, of, of software development, right? So, and, and Git is really sophisticated in that, uh, in that sense, because uh, in projects like the Linux kernel, right, you have to do complex operations, uh, figuring out which one went where. And then at the same time, they don't want to have everybody's trials in the history of the main project, right? So that's exactly the same uh, problem, I would say, uh, uh, matching your question so that that works. OK, thank you. Right, OK. Um, another burning question. We go a bit over time, maybe, because of the technical difficulties, and I will close very soon. But one more question, maybe, from the audience. There is a question in the chat, Maurice. Ah, OK. I don't see it. Now the question is, how does data lag tie into ML ops? OK. That's from Kurt, very good. Michel, do you want to start with this and then if you can I, add? I should not be the one starting. I don't know what MLOps is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay, maybe then I start, right? So so MLOps is basically machine learning. This is some operations where people want to also create reproducible pipelines and track everything that's happening from data to performance and then deploy the the final model it to to practical use cases, right? So that's as far as I understand, that's this ML ops uh, kind of the umbrella term for this. Um, so data lab provides all the tools hmm, that one can use to do this. Um, so that's a very clear, straightforward answer. Again, one needs to kind of decide how you kind of design uh, these different operations that you want to perform. So the, the example that I showed uh, in one of the last slides. So what we are going for is in this case of neuroimaging data, so which we consider as the raw or in machine learning terms, kind of unstructured data to features. And then from features, we do machine learning. So right, so we have this kind of two separate cases and we are, we are treating them as two different outputs. So we treat the, the features themselves as, a, as an output. And then we track this, how we came from the raw into the features and then we build some kind of like a feature store using this output, again, tracked by data lab. And then we pass that into a machine learning operations for learning uh, cross validation, dual selection, and so on, which again, tried by a separate data lab data set. So that's the way we have kind of designed this. But of course, you're free to choose how you want to choose different components and track them. I hope that answers uh, the question at least to some degree. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe just a, a quick add on to that. Uh, now that I know what it is, the, uh, the, the, the key bit is always that there is a, a data lab data set that has everything that's necessary to generate uh, it's the output that it tracks from inputs that are linked, from computational environments that are linked, and have the, the provenance attached to it. And now, depending on what the inputs are and what the processes are that you're capturing, that could be ML ops, right? So it's, it, but it could also be just file format conversion, right? That is, that is just a trivial execution that just is a meaningful first step for every subsequent processing. Uh, then you wouldn't call it something sophisticated, but it's, it is exactly the same kind of step. And then you can arbitrarily deeply nest these processing steps. Okay. Good. Yeah, I think actually in CUA arrays we have probably other tools as well, Kurt, that we. We're going to use for that um, from PyTorch, TensorFlow, and, and some specific tools. I think in the light of the time, um, it's time to close the seminar, but these gentlemen are surely there in the community to help with questions. We will provide the material online, and I just want to close with a couple of last slides here. First of all, thanks again for all of you joining. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties in the beginning. That was quite unusual, but happens every now and then with these digital seminars. So just to wrap up a little bit, um, if you want to know more about CUA Race itself, um, please go to the website. That's what you already know. There are all more details about the use cases, where we at. I hope the seminar gave you some idea um, what tools are relevant for us. And you see here, 
just what we discussed with MLOps and the other tools. Um, DataLab is one of them. We use also Horovod, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Jupyter, and all of those. We not necessarily give always seminars about it, but we look more into AI tools from the tool set. And that's why I also want to give you basically a sneak preview which is coming in the June seminar. But before I go there, just a reminder again, if you want to see what we did in the April seminar, uh, this was the uh, interaction room seminar. So two hours are recorded on YouTube with question and answers. Please feel free to go there. And also if you're there, please subscribe to our channel on the COE race um, if you want to know more. Um, the short appetizer for June, um, the date will be announced uh, basically mid of June when we have the speakers confirmed, um, is a toolkit called HEAT and it has really heat inside, I can tell you for many different reasons. So the Helmholtz Analytics Toolkit has been grown from science and engineering use cases. And this is a little bit of difference when you compare to many of the other frameworks which are around from PyTorch, TensorFlow and the known ones already. So in a sense, I call it HPC by design. So think about CPUs, GPUs, distributed cluster systems and so on. So it kind of fill in the gaps between these typical machine learning libraries, which are much more used for workstations, single nodes, versus the HPC cutting edge uh, use cases we have. And it's Python based, it's a very, very nice Python API. It is uh, sustainable, uh, created by Helmholtz. And I just give you a brief overview here and also a personal short anecdote, which is quite interesting here for us as, as host here at the University of Iceland, because one of the driver of this heat framework that we're gonna hear um, that also gets relevance in the Helmholtz AI um, framework in Germany. It's a large network of machine learning people working in science and engineering. So not any commercial use cases, recommenders or so, or rather really science and engineering. And hence, they're very comparable to those use cases we have in CUE race sometimes. And the interesting anecdote I wanted to share is just here, Markus Götz is one of the drivers. Um, you see him here. He was graduating from the University of Iceland here uh, since some time ago. And I'm, of course, for a professor, quite nice to see that uh, the connections you build during studying uh, to promote careers of scientists, of young scientists here in this case, are really working well. He's now one of the team leads in Helmholtz AI in Karlsruhe. More coming back to HEAT, what you can expect from the June seminar is to get more an idea why HEAT is quite interesting for us, not only because it's used by many science and engineering use cases, but you see also it has some features which other tools have not, um, from um, automatic differentiation to single multi-GPU usage, um, something we want to look at and of course, we'll close and um, have a look when we have this seminar. So stay tuned, please. Um, be ready in June. We will announce a date and time um, basically within June timeframe. And this could be really also an interesting technology of choice for some of the CUE race use cases and AI models. You see, they also not only uh, support neutral, uh, neural networks, they have also clustering and also let's say more helper methods in data science like principal component analysis or singular value decomposition. So things we probably need when we go to the use cases and this should be just a short announce. And I think that's all from my side. Thank you very much. The recording will be shortly available of this um, event um, on our YouTube channel. And with this, my final thanks go again to Kaustub and Michael to be available and see you next time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very again. So thank you. Cut the video here. And bye bye. <laughs> thanks also for Adina. I want to say I think I have seen her video. Wasn't that with the rabbits? Oh, that she did many. That's one of them. Yeah, yeah. I remember one of the one uh, where is she? I think in the in the rabbit. <laughs> in the, uh, yeah, yeah. I thought it was very lively. Also to have you know her contributing to this. Um, I cannot say how much we can use this, Andreas, and also to you, right? Um, we maybe have to see that some use cases will use it, some not. Um, we will, we're going to see about it. Yeah. I mean, if, if you have use cases where you, where you actively decide uh, that it's not useful, that would, would actually be interested in, in, in what is it uh, that, that you discover that doesn't work. And, and right. some of that will be 
you know, just that it, it's not meant to work, uh, but, but maybe something is something that we just don't encounter and would nevertheless be interested in, in, in supporting. So that kind of feedback would be appreciated. Yeah, I think sometimes the it's not about the technology side. What I had, uh, I worked long in UDA, the data infrastructure in Europe, right, um, which is now EOSC and, and so on and all of this. So we did lots of uh, B2Share handle system tracking and DUIs and so on. But I think the technical, all of them had this, say, Nodo and CERN um, and so on. But the, the, the trouble I see in science and engineering is the manpower. To have you know this data scientist, you need a PhD student and a data scientist or data provenance preservation expert alongside, kind of. Because if you really want to preserve, we did some journal papers where we had every load from the HPC run, every data set from the feature engineering. So there are a few, and all of that beautiful in B2Share and linked that with a handle into the journal, but it was a hell of a lot of time. <laughs> so I think that's the only issue I found. Uh, Although the journals, everyone was demanding this now more and more. Nobody thinks about the scientists that it's of course more and more work, right? Yeah. To, to preserve this. It may be placed into your hands later, um, but I guess still this working thing is, is something which you should also put in the grants, right? You say one PhD student and one data scientist that support the preservation or so yeah. uh, from this perspective. And we, we have, we have a, um... We, we've tried um, some of that uh, in, in the past. For example, we had a, a submission helper for uh, Nature's Scientific Data Journal. So they, could, they, they require you to generate uh, some metadata in a specific format is a tab. And, and so we had a, a, a tool basically in, in, in a data led extension that could you know, translate a community standard into that uh, metadata. Mm -hmm. And it, it actually overwhelmed them because there was so much metadata <laughs> that we could programmatically generate uh, that they said um, they would rather focus on something that is at least subjectively more interesting for discovery, right? And yeah. how do you decide that as a, yeah. as a metadata yeah. consumer, right? You, 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 ideally, you want to have as much as possible, but the systems that consume the metadata are themselves not capable of, of doing that, right? So it's it's all uh, it's all circular to 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 some degree, right? Everybody complains about lack of metadata, and then nobody develops the systems because there is no interesting metadata, and then the interesting metadata providers they have no systems to feed it into, right? So it's all it's all very intertwined. It was often discussions we had with the OIE PMH protocol, Dublin Core metadata core, which in the end doesn't give you community speciality right so in the yeah. end lots of lacks and yeah. lots of discussion with peter wittenburg you maybe know him i don't know he's a metadata man from niemegen do you know him by chance no, not personally okay yeah good but we have closed the seminar and i don't want to keep you too long um right thank you very much also adina again and andreas for joining in i expected a couple of more people but yeah some actually approached me that there's a recording if there's one they can't join so maybe it still, I think, was very useful. I saw many people from our project. So YouTube in, is in different point. use cases, in all the different use cases, I see all the different names. And I yeah. think that was already very beneficial. I would do, I want to make one one last remark. I want to specifically thank Kamstub because the um, what what probably wasn't clear uh, because nobody has mentioned it. Uh, about a year ago, um, the entire institute essentially uh, had to switch to data led for accessing these large data sets that Kaushuk mentioned uh, in his talk. And, and of course, then there is, there is a sudden increase in support uh, requirements, uh, specifically from, from, the, from the advisor side, right? Because all the students now have, had, have questions. Whatever they did before, now they need to be doing something else. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the entire institute of uh, roughly 80 people is essentially dog fooding that system uh, at scale uh, mm -hmm. uh, for a year, and and Kaushub was one of the pioneering uh, adopters. So you know, specific thanks goes to him for still being among the living <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, the to, to tell the tale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I'm I'm very of course I think it's it takes a little bit of time to learn new technology, but as I said, the benefits are are definitely a lot more than whatever the small amount of pain that I had to go through. So. 
Thanks a lot. Still, and thanks a lot, Maurice, as well. So for yeah. organizing this very, very interesting yeah. series. Yeah. Was yeah. No thanks. Was no problem. <laughs> no problem. Thanks for your availability. Okay, let's call it. And yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good day. Bye.